Ah, nostalgia. It's one hell of a drug. I was not into tabletop in the 90s, so my nostalgia starts with early 2000s stuff like this. And if you're anything like me, you know the feeling of walking into your local game store and spending hours looking at the shelves full of miniatures, impressed by the box art and aspiring to be able to paint like that. I want to turn videos like this into a regular installment on my channel because I think it's fun to revisit that feeling. And I also think there's a lot to learn from trying to paint like the box art. Like that in painting there's not just one way to get to a desired result. And that you don't always need the same precise color that they used. Sometimes it's impossible to know the colors. It certainly is impossible to get to what is on the front of the box by using what they tell you on the back of the box. And maybe, just maybe, some of you are today like I was back in the day looking at the paint jobs on these boxes and trying to figure them out. Because after all, even though they might not be the most innovative, principles of these remain the same even after 20 years. But they have inspired painters for decades and there's still something to aspire to as a new painter. Just look through Instagram and see how many painters are captivated by the box art style of Games Workshop. So leave a like if you want to see more videos like this or a dislike if you hate the idea. And let me know which box art you want to see next down in the comment section. For this episode, let me show you a mini that I painted back when the Age of Darkness box came out that was inspired by an official picture on Wham community. I don't know why, but I was intrigued by this official ultramarine art and I wanted to try and copy it for fun. I assembled the mini as close as possible as the official Wham community post showed and applied a black primer. Then I gave it a coat of who would have guessed McCrack Blue. Of course you can use a brush, but to speed things up, I whipped out the trusty airbrush. But wait a minute, this doesn't look like McCrack Blue at all. The blue looks kind of grey, definitely nothing like the usual Ultramarine's blue. Back then I thought, hmm, are they maybe trying to go a new direction with the Ultramarine scheme for Horus Heresy? And I'll be honest, I kind of like that. So I mixed Eshing Grey into the McCrack blue and applied two layers, until I had a consistent coat. But while I did that, I kept thinking to myself, I could swear that I saw this mini painted in a different scheme. So I started digging through the Instagram accounts of some of the heavy metal painters I knew, and then I found a proper picture on Drew Pally's page. And it looked completely different. They probably let the intern do all the photoshopping again at the studio. So with the gold post adjusted, I went back to a base layer of McCrack blue. The original looks a lot darker though than pure McCrack blue, that's why it gave everything a wash of Draken of Nightshade, making sure the pigment pools in the recesses to create the dark lining effect. And this creates some depth easily and distinguishes all the elements as you can see on the rivets of the shoulder. While I went back to the paint job that I'm trying to copy frequently to check if I'm on the right track, I noticed that the lower parts of the armor were shaded a lot more. Something the Ebbe Metal team has been doing more and more ever since the Indominus box came out. I'm trying to copy this by letting the wash pool in these lower areas of the leg armor. Which results in a nice smooth gradient if you are a little patient and apply a couple of layers on top of each other. Pushing the pigments towards the darker area of the panel. Just make sure that every layer is dry before you apply the next. The results look close and I couldn't tell a difference. But just out of curiosity, I asked Drew what he was using, and it turns out that the shading was done by adding rhinoxide to the base color, which makes the blue a lot richer and deeper. Obviously, I won't always know exactly how the box arts were painted, and I won't always get to ask the painter that did it. But that's okay. I want to show you approaches that lead to really similar results, and maybe this can inspire you to be a bit more relaxed about your paint jobs and not trying to always do the right thing. or trying to find the correct way of painting. Because if this shade of blue is not 100% like the shade of blue on the box art, it's ruined. I'm going to have to start over. To make some of these recesses a little darker, I used the black wash and applied it to areas like around the chest strap and anything that was really deep and also some parts I wanted to paint black anyway. Like this small detail just above the belt buckle and the eye lenses and the bellows joints. Thanks a lot to this video's sponsor, Frontier Wargaming, which you probably know for their awesome mobile paint case, which has been a godsend not only for people that want to paint while traveling, but also painters that don't have a lot of space available and want to store away their hobby stuff when they're done for the day. The case is fully customizable. You can add miniature holders, magnetized trays, 
all kinds of trays that fit your different paint brands. They have a wet palette that you can add and there's even a built-in light source. But today I also want to show you their newest release, the fully customizable paint station. I have way too many paints and I never found a proper storage solution until I found Frontier Wargaming. The racks look super stylish and even though there's a little assembly required, it's totally worth it. All the elements they offer for the paint station are fully customizable, like the racks can hold trays custom made for every paint brand out there, and you can even mount them to a wall to save space. You can build a station that fits your needs with all the available elements, and the good thing is they slot right into each other, so you can stack and combine however many of these you want. Need some extra trays to store your tools? No problem. Or do you want to place your laptop on your workspace to watch Netflix while painting, or to be able to search for some inspiration? Frontier of Wargaming's modular paint station will adapt to your available space and will give it utility, organization and extra space just like it did for me. If you follow the link in the video description and use the code TRAVARIAN2022 on checkout, you will get 10 euro off of every order equal or above 100 euros. They do ship worldwide so don't squander this opportunity. If your paint space needs some optimization, head over to Frontier Wargaming and treat yourself to one of their hobby solutions at a discount. I give all of this a quick coat of matte varnish at this point. And you can see that the colors look a little different when the gloss is gone, but it just get irritated by the surface being all shiny. I just can't help it. But we'll fix this in a bit. If we look at the original, we can see the typical edge highlighting pattern of a thicker line with a darker highlight color, and then the more confined, brighter highlights. So I'm using McCrack Blue mixed about 50-50 with Kaga Blue, so the transition isn't too harsh for the first layer. Remember, for a simple edge highlight on a rank and file, you'd probably go pure Kaga Blue right away, but we are replicating a studio paint job here, so a little more care has to go into this. You can see that I'm using a glaze consistency and drag the brush across the surface a couple of times to build up the first highlight layer. Especially up here, you will notice that the first stroke goes on a more transparent and I build a little blend by stacking these lines on top of each other. The more patient you are here, the smoother the blend will be, obviously. And I'll keep doing this until all the edges are covered. Then for the thinner second highlight I'm using pure Kaga Blue and you can see that I regularly shape my brush tip on my thumb to make sure the brush doesn't leave wider lines than needed before I put the brush even close to the mini. Now and then I catch myself painting highlights the way you would expect them to look if there was a realistic light source around, which means the lower edges would reflect more light. But then I realized we're doing heavy metal, which means all edges the same. Yeah, let's go. But of course, one cannot deny that if we are not defining holes that are half a millimeter wide, this approach generally really complements minis like Space Marines, pronouncing all the shapes and making the mini easily readable. Which makes sense. You want to present the mini clear and crisp on the box after all. At the same time, making this highlight smaller and leaving parts of the first one still visible creates the impression of a relatively soft transition and adds to the feeling of crispness, while harsh highlights can easily make minis look messy. Some of these highlights were a lot brighter than just Kaga Blue though, so I added a bit of Wolf Grey and made the highlights just a bit brighter. I usually let the paint dry a bit on the brush in this stage, so I don't accidentally splotch on a tiny blob of paint and only the very edges are covered. Once I was done with the edge highlights, I added back some of the satin finish that the original has with a very diluted layer of Drakenhof Nightshade. As some of that shine adds back the richness that we lost when applying the matte varnish. The metallics look pretty straightforward and I applied a base layer of Vallejo airbrush colors, white aluminium for the steel parts. And gold for the handle, the base of the plume and the rivets on the shoulder. You can use whatever metallics you have as a base because the intensity and final color comes from the washes we'll apply on top. For the gold, I used Nasrag Yellow and Fuegan Orange until I was happy with the hue of the gold. 
And I gotta say, this is still my favorite way to paint gold, because it doesn't really matter which acrylic gold you use as a base. None of it can get even close to the intensity you'll get using this technique. I shaded the steel parts on the chest with black to create some depth, and then proceeded to recreate the pattern on the original sword, which was darker towards the lower part on the front edge. And this takes a few layers, but it creates a nice transition and some great depth. Checking back with the original, I also noticed that the gold had some black shadows, so I quickly applied these too. before using pure white aluminium to bring back some edge highlights on the steel parts and the sword. Pa's sword effect looked really great, even though it appeared relatively simple to do. But you know, sometimes the simple approaches are the most effective. At the time I was testing the new contrast paints and Briar Queen Chill looked like it would be the exact thing that was used here. Using contrast paint means it's relatively simple to create a gradient because of its transparent nature. So just building up a few layers resulted in a really similar effect quickly. I thought I needed a final dot to fight to really make it shine so I quickly did that. And then I placed some highlight points on the gold parts with a mix of my base gold color and white aluminium. I really like the Briar Queen chill, so I wanted to use it again, even though if we look at the original, that off-white on the shoulder is probably a bit warmer in hue than this mix here, which results in a more cold color. You see that adding the contrast color makes for a more transparent finish for each layer, which comes in handy when we are doing the white markings on the front of the helmet. I was stippling on the outline of the markings and filled in the rest, making sure that it didn't end up looking too homogenous to mimic some wear on the paint. I decided to use the same color for the plume and then added the black parts, following some of the recesses to be able to mark off the dark and light areas sharply. I highlighted the black parts by adding some of the mix I used for the bright hair to keep everything coherent. And then gradually went brighter until I was using the pure mix to place the last highlights. While I added more and more whites to highlight the bright areas. I used the same mix to highlight the markings and for the edge highlights on the shoulder all the way up to pure white. Oh, and a fun little anecdote, I didn't have a blue ultramarine decal, so I used a white one and painted over it with blue. I don't have that filmed because it involved a lot of holding my breath and uh, trying to paint within the lines and a lot of swearing. But better than forking out 25 bucks on a decal sheet. You know, if these were 10 or 12, I'd buy them all probably. But 25 bucks, come on. Luckily, the 13th Legion decal comes with a few other boxes and the two triangles are simple geometrical shapes and were easily free-handed. Something else that started popping up on official paint jobs back when the Indominus box was coming out was battle damage. Here I started to add scratches and chips with white and I tried to copy them from the original as closely as possible. Even though I think I got carried away a bit on the ultramarine symbol on the shoulder. For the dark chips, I used the mix of rhinoxide and black, and again I followed the original patterns and added a few additional chips and scratches here and there. For the bad damage on the blue armor, I used Kaga blue mixed with wolf gray, and I varied the brightness a bit depending on how dark the base color of the armor was in the respective area. I made sure that all the elements were chipped and damaged consistently, like 13th legion marking and the white stripe on the helmet. 
The eyes were painted in the classic red lens pattern, which starts from a black base. And then adding layers of Mephiston red covering just about two thirds and gradually covering less than this area with brighter colors, like orange. I lost a bit of the black in the opposite corner of these highlights, which I added back by glazing in a few layers, and then added a speck in the highlight with pure white. I gave the blue lens on the helmet a similar treatment, using deep sky blue that I mixed with a bit of contrast Eldari Emerald, just so I had a similar color to the original. I added a bit of black so I could achieve smoother transitions for my main color, and then gradually adding more and more pure deep sky blue to build a gradient. And eventually, I was adding a tiny bit of white for the brightest parts of the crescent moon shape. And pure white for the specular highlight again. I painted the plasma coils white and judging from the original, there was just a few washes over a white base coat, so I added a few layers of Eldari Emerald until I was happy with the result. And that's it. That's as close as I could get to the closest thing of a box art for a Horus Heresy Ultramarine. What do you think? How close did I get on a scale from 1 to 10? Also don't forget to let me know which box art you would like to see next. As always, I'll upload a longer version of this video to my Patreon and to the YouTube members section. Thanks a lot to all my patrons, YouTube supporters and Twitch subscribers. Your support makes these videos possible. Luckily the 13th legion legion Luckily the 13th legion It certainly is impossible to get to what is on the front of the So leave a like if you do 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 and let me know in the comment and let me know fucking